She's not here. Notify local hospitals, cab companies, the state troopers, and local cops. Any security officers off duty or back on duty. Who is she speaking to with that magic button? I need one of those. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 2, Episode 16, Safe. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 house videos, and this will be Episode 63. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. A mask. Give me a kiss or I'll kill you. Your skin. What's wrong? <laughs> Is this the beginning of a house episode or a third grade sex ed tape? You want to know what kissing boys tastes like? I'll tell you, the afterlife. Also, that EpiPen placement from the mom was atrocious. She pretty much put it straight in the girl's kneecap. Part of the reason why we give it in the leg is because the outer thigh hasn't got any important structures nearby and usually it has a good amount of fat for the drug to get absorbed in. You'd have to work pretty hard to get a thick enough fat layer on the kneecap to rival it. What the patient had though looked like anaphylaxis, which is an acute severe reaction to something. Most commonly it could be an insect sting, peanut. The EpiPen helps open up the airways to give us time to stabilize the patient and get them somewhere safer. And as you're giving it, always remember orange to the thigh, blue to the sky. Otherwise, you'll have a crash call for two patients as you stab yourself in the thumb. I once had a 22 year old patient who had anaphylaxis though, and three to four hours after the first dose, she started getting breathless again. That's because of a delayed hypersensitivity reaction that you always have to be careful of. Carrying two EpiPens then, if you have a severe allergy, is always a good idea. So how are the team gonna figure out the cause now? The allergic reaction happened while she was in a clean room. Heart transplant, immune system's in the toilet. Jane stayed in the tree house. Tarzan came up. You guys had sex? Oh, I did everything I could to make sure she wouldn't get sick. Latex allergy? What do you mean, like a condom? We didn't... How about a semen allergy? A lot to go through here. The patient has been through an insane amount, almost dying three times from similar reactions to penicillins, peanuts, and bee stings. She also recently snuck out while her mom wasn't at home, bought a muffin from the shop and didn't realize it had peanuts in it, had a reaction while driving, and crushed her chest on a steering wheel, losing her original heart. So she needed a heart transplant, which she just had, and now her immune system is fried because of the anti-rejection meds. <sighs> I'm exhausted just listening to that story. Also, it seems like lover boys said they were being as careful as possible and then decided not to use a condom. Seems like he learned his safe sex practices from Irene and Charles DeMello, a couple who birthed 23 children, the last of which was in 1958. So what could this allergy be? Believe it or not, you can actually be allergic to semen, causing a change in skin color, burning, and swelling, even a difficulty breathing. But when she had that reaction, they were kissing, so surely it couldn't be that. Maybe we think it's allergy, but it's not, and just something that's mimicking allergy. Let's find out. That's what's negative, no semen allergy. What'd you take? Antibiotics penicillin took a bunch for like a week she's allergic to penicillin we believe it's highly unlikely that this set of circumstances will repeat itself what set of circumstances this reminds me of an actual case study in the american journal of medicine titled almost killed by love Penicillins have the highest allergy rate of any antibiotics with reactions happening in between one and 10% of people. Now we know that when a guy takes penicillin, it can concentrate in his semen and when doing the reverse river dance can somehow make its way to being absorbed through the vaginal wall. You'd think this was a theoretical thing, but in 2019, a 46-year-old woman presented to a &E with sweating, dizziness, diarrhea, and skin flushing just one to two hours after having sex with her husband. Her husband was being treated for an infection of the heart with an IV penicillin. She'd never been exposed to that antibiotic before, and on assessment, her blood pressure had plummeted to 67 over 42, which is about half of what it should be. She was given more antibiotics thinking she had an infection, but all her tests came back negative and she was fine again within 24 hours as they didn't give her any penicillins. This is insanely rare and only been reported about three times and only once was the onset of symptoms more than 24 hours after the original exposure, which it would be here. Definitely not the kind of climax she was expecting. I can't breathe. Getting the oh, oh. She's coughing up white sputum. 
not an allergy, it's her heart. She's clean. You don't show any signs of coronary artery disease. So what's next? A heart surgical biopsy to rule out rejection. Very accurate and impressive here from the writers. You see, after the transplant, you would do a CT scan first to see if there was some organ rejection. After that, then a biopsy is considered. Normal heart tissue under a microscope looks fairly organized with the cardiomyocytes and dense connective tissue. In transplant rejection though, you get these immune cells invading or infiltrating the tissue, which begin to damage the organ. Around 15 to 30% of transplant recipients can develop some type of rejection, but as long as it's caught early, it can be reversed. That would be with stronger immunosuppressive medications than they'd already be taking, but that can leave you very vulnerable to infections. If caught late, then retransplant has to be strongly considered, otherwise the organ can fail. The opposite of acute transplant rejection is graft versus host disease, where usually it's bone marrow that's transplanted, which begins to attack the new host, rather than the host attacking the transplant. It can also be lethal though. So a question for you smart people, how long does someone live on average after a heart transplant? Answers down below. You still haven't done the dishes? I absolutely was negative for rejection. So we still don't know what caused her heart failure. She's not here. Notify local hospitals, cap companies, the state troopers, and local cops. Any security officers off duty or back on duty. Who is she speaking to with that magic button? I need one of those. Seems like it is an organ rejection that the patient has, which would be great to tell her when they actually find her. I had a 27 year old patient who went missing when I was on cardiothoracics. He was due to have his operation that day. Then when we went to get him in the morning, he just wasn't there. Most of us thought that he had cold feet before the operation, but it turned out that he just thought that the anesthetist drugs were a bit weak, so went to go get some of his own. Interestingly, he had been using heroin, which is why he needed heart surgery in the first place. And he thought since he already had a line in his vein that he'd just help himself to it. Never a dull day in healthcare. She's obviously still in the building. I'm trying to scare your parents. Great job. I hate her. It feels kind of weird. Oh, that left leg now has a foot drop. What does that mean? Since it wasn't there before and she hasn't had any clear injury, then it's likely related to nerve dysfunction. The most common nerve that's affected is called a common perineal nerve. We call this a high stepping gait because the person needs to step high to avoid their toes from dragging across the floor. Causes can then be a disc prolapse in the spine pressing on the nerve, diabetes, compression from a spinal tumor, lupus, Waldenstrom's macroglobulemia causing vasculitis is another potential. Could also be because of viral infections or exposure to toxins and we know that the episode title is called safe the most ironic thing here is that her being in that clean room is causing this could it be a toxic byproduct of one of the cleaning products that mom uses that's going to be my first diagnostic guest solvent neurotoxicity let's see if i'm right why is her like twitching like that it's paralysis and it's ascending get an lp and do pcrs for the viruses and get an EMG to check for Guillain-Barre. Neurologist Foreman, you should know that those twitches you saw are called fasciculations. They're a sign of an upper motor neuron lesion. Why? Because from the brain to any part of the body, you have two main relay neurons that transmit the signal. The first, an upper motor neuron, goes all the way from the brain to the spinal cord at the level that the nerve root exits. The second and lower motor neuron then is like, I'll take it from here. It carries the signal all the way to the muscle fibers. How does that relate to twitching? Well, if that first neuron goes more haywire than Will Smith at the Oscars, then it loses the ability to regulate the second neuron causing hyperreflexia, fasciculations that we saw, increased tone in the long term, weakness, and something called Babinski sign. As a neurologist, he'd definitely want to check that in this patient. You just tickle the bottom of the foot and the toes point up rather than down. It's normal to have that in babies, but it's pathological in adults. And Foreman suggested Guillain-Barre syndrome just now based on these fasciculations. So what is that and why is it not quite right? Well, Guillain-Barre is where the myelin insulated wiring of the lower motor neuron is lost, which produces a different set of signs like muscle wasting, low tone, and reduced reflexes compared to an upper motor neuron lesion that we discussed 
earlier. That's why it's so important to examine thoroughly. There are conditions that can cause mixed upper and lower motor neuron signs as well, like motor neuron disease and polio. So many other things that can cause this too. Well, I'll be interested to see what other clues come out. Now, if you're excited to see all the other mistakes Foreman's gonna make, then check out the channel membership. You get priority access to new videos, access to exclusive polls, and to suggest another series and episode for me to react to. The first 30 members have a chance to win a one hour, one-on-one, -on -one, two to session with me on a topic of your choice. We currently have 24 members with only six spots left. So press join to secure your spot. I'll keep working tirelessly to make it worth your while. The LP and PCR has ruled out polio in West Nile. We think it's Guillain-Barre. She's giving up. She's using accessory muscles. Uh, no knowledge. Uh, it's the paralysis. Let's reach your lungs. Okay, this is exactly what Guillain-Barre would do as it causes an ascending paralysis because of autoimmunity. It could most commonly be triggered by a digestive system bacterial infection, which you can get from undercooked chicken. Again, that doesn't quite fit the muscle twitch symptoms she had, so what else could it be? Botulism, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, thiamine deficiency could do it. But how could she get them? We know she has an overprotective mother. What if her mom tried to protect her by home canning her foods because she's so allergic to everything that she's worried about what store foods could do to her. Then in the process of trying to keep her safe, created a Petri dish for Clostridium botulinum that produces the most deadly toxin known to man, botulinum toxin, which you may have heard of before as Botox. Ingesting that could cause all of her symptoms and would fit the storyline as well. That is my second diagnostic guess. Now it's incredibly difficult to test for botulism as it's hard to culture the bacteria or isolate the toxin. So the most accurate way so far is pretty brutal. It's called the mouse lethality assay. You take a person's blood, inject it into a mouse. If the mouse then develops botulism, then it's positive. Although there's nothing positive about killing Jerry. Poor Jerry. Brutal, but once confirmed, you could give antitoxin, which would cure her. Linda's dying. It's like she got poisoned with a nerve agent. What else has she been deprived of? She's on a special diet because of her allergies. Also brings a side dish, botulism. It's the only way to confirm this. Inject the rat with her blood. What? Are they actually gonna do it? This shows exactly how lethal botulinum toxin is. Even after it's been diluted by liters of blood, it's still lethal enough to kill a rat or mouse. What's even crazier is that Botox can be a bioweapon and a wonder drug all at once. Yes, it can take people's wrinkles away, but in small doses, it can do some other pretty awesome things like reduce sweating in hyperhidrosis or migraines, relax muscles in spastic disorders where tone is too high, which can even include the bladder. The lethal dose is around 2,500 units, which is 0 0.000000 zero 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 one to five grams just a hundred grams then could kill everyone on planet earth that's the weight of half a grapefruit i knew they were evil for facial injections usually only about 100 units is used which is 25 times less than the lethal dose Listen to me, have you eaten anything abnormal? Any canned foods? No. You sure? Let me know about the sex. Is that the Danny's little Danny is full of penicillin? It's a good device and what I use. <laughs> the antibiotics that can cause the anaphylaxis. Still on the table. Either she's lying about the canned foods, which why would she when they already know about the sex, or it's something else. This whole him sneaking through the window thing, surely from a story perspective, has to be linked. The episode title is safe as well, so I'm sure the writer's message is gonna be about being overprotective, screwing people up, which I can definitely see here. What if when her boyfriend was climbing in through the window, he brought something else in with him? He went through the trees, so could he have gone through long grass or come in contact with animals as well? What about drugs? But they wouldn't necessarily cause this paralysis. If he went through the long grass, then he could have picked up a tick, which caused tick paralysis that Cameron did mention early in the episode. So what is tick paralysis? Well, a tick with a neurotoxin produced in its salivary glands 
bites you, which can cause an ascending paralysis, starting at the feet and moving upwards. You don't get fever or flu-like symptoms, and it can actually kill you once it gets to the breathing muscles. You can diagnose it by checking the patient for ticks, like in the scalp, ear canals, hairline, or pubic region, and it often gets confused with Guillain-Barre, which the team are suspecting. I mean, it does fit pretty perfectly. So here goes nothing. My third and final diagnostic guess with a bit of a tip off from Cameron goes to tick paralysis. Let's see. When Dan came to your house that night, did you go through any tall grass? Oh, fence. <laughs> he has tick paralysis. Dan couldn't keep his tick in his pants. Okay, magical tick hunt is over. Only real doctor stuff now. That tick is an IV drip of poison. We unhook it, she'll be fine. Who knew Danny over here was moonlighting as Tom Cruise? Fence jumping must just make him tick. Now she's clearly deteriorating as if it is a tick, it must keep biting her and House wants to find it and remove it rather than putting a band-aid on the problem by stabilizing her heart. In reality, you'd probably want to do both at the same time, but I do wonder where he's gonna go looking next because he checked her scalp and that didn't show anything. Wilson helped him out by advising Cuddy that they needed to get in the lift and then House was able to lock them in there so he could play Where's Wally? Bug edition. It's my last entry. Lasts us about three minutes. It's gonna count up. We've looked over every inch of skin on her body, House. It's over. Oh. Sick, miserable. See? Should be completely cured by tomorrow. He found it! Pretty risky move to be fair though. If it pays off, you're a genius, but if it backfires, the only thing being named after you is your cell block. Once the tick is gone, then the patient usually feels better within a few hours and symptoms completely resolve within one to two days. Brilliant diagnosis for House, to be honest. These season two episodes are getting more and more creative. Can't believe I got this one, but I did have a lot of help from Cameron who mentioned it early in the episode. Glad she got the diagnosis right, rather than the usual plot of her hoping for the best from people and then being as wrong as wrong can be, like expecting that a married couple be happy, betting money on it and realizing they're actually plotting to kill each other. House writers have no faith in humanity. Looks like somebody filed halfway through your cane while you were sleeping. Reflexes back to normal. And back to school on Monday. I'm sick, huh? You're not sick. Brilliant to see that the girl is better, but even more brilliant that the mother is letting go so she can live. The mom has been allocating the sick role to her daughter for so long that she began to have a deviance. See, in the 1950s, someone called Talcott Parsons, who's one of the fathers of medical sociology, described having illness as exactly that a deviance. You see, health is generally necessary to plug into society, and so being sick sometimes puts people into this other group. Parsons suggested that this role gave people certain perceptions, rights, and responsibilities. So firstly, that the person themselves isn't responsible for having that sick role. The second is that they're exempt from carrying out some of the normal social duties like work or looking after family. Third, that their aim should be to try and get well. Lastly, that they need to submit to appropriate medical care because of their illness. The lines have now been blurred though, as they're not so binary as they were in Parsons' time. Some people have chronic conditions and still work while being sick out of necessity, even though they probably should be off. Some doctors feel patients try to take on this sick role intentionally, but the truth is that most people try and avoid it as much as physically possible. A little bit of empathy can go a long way in understanding what our patients can go through. And we shouldn't label them or make assumptions about their intentions. So brilliant episode with a great message. I'd say eight out of 10 entertainment, 7.5 out of 10 accuracy, and nine out of 10 diagnosis, tick paralysis. Incredible. If you thought this was good though, then watch the previous one so that this makes full sense where a couple's kinks get public.